We're in Acts chapter 6, and in the book of Acts, we're looking, and we have been looking at the birth of the church, and, uh, you know, up until chapter 5, it's all been fun and games. It's been pretty darn exciting. A lot's been happening. But when you get people involved, there are problems, and that's what begins with chapter 5, and we're going to look at that in chapter 6, and that's okay. You know, we've got the ultimate problem solver. I was joking with Tony before I got up here on the stage and that in heaven, I believe that I will be the male version of Aretha Franklin and I will be able to sing full throttle. <laughs> right now, that is not happening. There are many that can attest to that. But uh, that's his perspective because this life is a sneeze compared to eternity. And what we face now, for some of us that have been with the Lord for a while, we can look back on issues that were so insurmountable and say, Lord, they seem like they weren't going to go away, and, and yet the Lord is able to do what we can't do, and, and I'm grateful for that. So in Acts chapter 6, Satan tries to work through prejudice and through division among people, and it, it's a big church. Um, we see Satan trying to disrupt the inward peace of the early church. Satan is unhappy, always, but he's unhappy about God's successes and he sows a spirit of murmuring and gossip among God's people, hoping to set believer against believer. We should not be surprised that there are problems with people. And so the right reaction is what they do in this situation is they focus on the solution, which is great. It is easy, especially in a church the size of us, to want to form little committees on all the problems and just take people out. And uh, that's not what God has called us to do. So the Spirit had stopped adding to the church, according to chapter 2, verse 47, and he started multiplying. Remember, 3,000 men get saved on Pentecost. 5,000 men have been saved shortly thereafter. To this, their wives, children, and other family, you can see the church is growing by leaps and bounds. It's estimated that in the Jerusalem church at this time, there's between 20 and 50,000 people. That is a mega church. That's a big church. And so as a church grows larger, so does its potential for problems. As a church grows larger, so does its need for strong, godly leadership. I have to say that Amber and I have been blessed this week. A guy who came out of Calvary, Philly, um, something Springs, but I think he's in Philadelphia, just shared about, and it's just stuck with me all this week, about how, you know, since we're the size that we are, we should really take advantage of that spend time together, and eat food together, which makes me think of so many jokes right now, but I won't go there, but uh, we should get together, eat toast, but we should get together while we can, while we're the size that we are, because you can have that intimacy in a small church, that closeness, that family atmosphere. So speaking of family atmosphere, let's look at family, dysfunctional, whatever. Verse 1, chapter 6 says, Now in those days... When the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So amidst the Jews themselves, there was a division. In the Christian church, there were two kinds of Jews. The Hellenists represented those that had still held on to some of the Greek culture. Historically, we know that when Alexander the Great went and conquered the known world as he did, that what he did was he instituted Greek philosophy and literature and customs into that culture. And so naturally, people assimilated uh, those type of things. And so you had Hellenistic Jews that would still go to Hellenistic synagogues. They would read the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was the Septuagint, right out. One person listening, right out. Okay. And so, and then the other... Um, uh, Jews, uh, Palestinian Jews, would have embraced the Hebrew Old Testament. And so uh, this contempt that was there, because in a sense, the Palestinian Jews kind of thought of themselves as kind of snooty, kind of uppity, kind of above the Hellenistic Jews. And so um, you have prejudice there. And this uh, contempt affected the daily distribution of offerings. Uh, there's a complaint that the widows of the Greek-speaking Jews were possibly being deliberately neglected, though we don't know if that's founded or not. That was the perception. 
Sometimes that's enough in a church, just that there's a perception of something happening. What did they do? They dealt with it. But again, Proverbs 14.4 says, Where there are no oxen, the trough is clean. We have oxen. The trough is not clean. Amen to that. Not a clean trough. There is naturally already a suspicion between the two groups. Satan tries to take advantage of that standing suspicion. Again, prejudice in any form stops the love from flowing out and extending itself to another human being. So any kind is wrong. Whenever there's prejudice, there's a feeling of people being, again, uppity or snotty, and you're going to find in situations where insiders and outsiders collide, that'll happen. And, and again, I, one of the things that I think comes out through the teaching as we're going through the book of Acts is that we're going to have new people coming through the door probably each week. People that aren't saved here on a Sunday morning. And we need to realize again that they're just not going to be made well. They're not going to walk through the door and instant holiness comes upon them. Just like you and I, they need the word of God and they need worship. They need the Holy Spirit. We all need these things collectively to be able to grow, to be able to change. So apparently at this time in the synagogue, there was a routine custom. Two collectors would go around the market and the private houses every Friday morning, and they made a collection for the needy, uh, partly in money and partly in goods. Later in the day, this was distributed, and those who were temporarily in need received enough to enable them to carry on. Those who were permanently unable to support themselves, and I'm thinking of widows, like what we're talking about, they would get 14 meals. So that would be two meals for a full week. So the fund from this uh, distribution uh, that was made was called the Kupa, which sounds like my big fat Greek wedding. Kupa. You're not with me, okay. Or basket is what it's also called. In addition to this, a house-to-house -house collection was made daily for those in pressing need, and this was called the tamhoi, which just rolls off the tongue, or tray, which sounds a lot easier to say. So, yeah, And I could be totally butchering this. I have no idea. So it's important to know, and this is the point that I want to kind of drive home, is how do they deal with complaints? Because, they're, again, they're going to happen. Verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Don't you know, and, and I know a lot of you, and I know a lot of you that are involved in teaching ministry, that it takes time and it takes discipline to study the word of God. Amen? You've got to research things, you've got to pray over it, you've got to craft it. It's hard work to study, to dig, and to give people a good spiritual meal. One hermeneutics professor said, if you've got a hundred people and you preach to them for an hour unprepared, you've wasted 100 hours of God's time. So I owe it to you personally to study, to look over the text, to give you a meal like a spiritual cook, which makes me think of the Swedish chef right now. Just me, though. So verse 3, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, and that word is marturo, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So seven men, possibly, for each day of the week. We don't know. Um, but again, uh, we see that the murmuring of a group within the church led to the election and ordination of deacons, which is what we're going to dis discuss here today as one of the main themes of chapter 6. Uh, the Greek word from which we get our word deacon occurs in this passage, and it's translated serve or ministry. It made me think of, uh, of course, Chuck Smith. If you've listened to Calvary Chapel teachings at all, he would go through and he'd pick up cigarette butts from the parking lot. And his mom always taught him never to pick them up because they were gross or whatever. And so he, he just caught himself one day just like, you know, this is gross, you know. And the Lord kind of busted him and said, well, you know, who are you doing it for? You know, well, I'm doing it for you, Lord. Well, then shut up, <laughs> you know. And, and in a lot of ways, the Lord needs to convict me you know, and convict you, you know, because we're not doing it so that the Calvary Chapel police come in and say, good job, you know, or way to go, or the Spirit of Chuck Smith rests upon you. We're doing it for Jesus Christ, amen? So at least that's, that's what we're supposed to do. So the apostles served or ministered in the word, and the men who were chosen upon this occasion were to serve or minister to those at tables or in general to serve as financial officers of the church. 
Now look at the character qualifications that are listed there in that statement. Again, um, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. Um, so the first qualification is men among you. What that means is people that are saved. The leadership here at Calvary Chapel is made up of saved people. And, and hate to say it, but there are some churches where deacons or people even in leadership, and I listened to Skip Heidzig teach this week, where he gave an altar call and an elder from another church got saved. Didn't know the Lord. Hadn't given his life to the Lord. And that's part of, unfortunately, the society that we deal with. So first off, they have to be men from among you. They have to be born again. Secondly, um, and that's not a great witnessing tool, <laughs> putting somebody who's not saved in a leadership position. Secondly, you have a good reputation. They have a character of integrity. They're not perfect people. Otherwise, nobody would be here. You would be very lonely. We would only hear about the services. Nobody would attend. But somebody said that uh, the word we get integrity from is integer. And, and that's how you behave. I mean, you're you're one-minded is what that word means. Think about this. How do we behave when nobody else is there to see us? That's integrity. So i uh, got to be born again. Got to have integrity. Uh, got to be able to handle money would be an aspect of somebody in leadership that uh, has integrity. Um, you know, and also, too, they have to be at the church for a while. You know, we don't just invite pedestrians and jaywalkers to come in into leadership at the church. Uh, we have to get to know them. And we're not going to have them in charge of our kids, amen? People that we have to know. So this is important. And um, so they have to have a chance to prove themselves, not a novice. They have to be filled with the Spirit. Sometimes in our society and from various denominations, that can have different connotations. Here's a better way to phrase that, controlled by the Spirit. I know that my kids early on memorized what the fruit of the Spirit is, and you can reel off, you know, through the Spirit's love. But to be controlled by the Spirit, a lot of times, I think, in our culture, means that sometimes God kind of slows us down. You ever find that in the course of your work or your day or situations in life, the Holy Spirit's talking to you, if you'll allow him, if you'll listen to him, and he's telling you, hey, you know what? What you said, maybe it was, maybe that was kind of rude or kind of cold, you know? You should, you should talk to that person in a loving manner. And, and the way that that Holy Spirit is described in the book of Acts, it's like a referee blowing a whistle and just kind of speaking to you in a supernaturally in a natural way. Hey, Chuck, you know what? Maybe this person didn't appreciate that. Or, you know what? Go share with this person. This person's hurting. Again, you're being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And that means that heaven, we, we pray the Our Father, right? on earth that is in heaven. It means that heaven is communicating with me and, and I'm listening. Sometimes, a lot of times, people in, in conversations will be like, well, you know, I just don't hear from God and I want to know what my calling is. But I think a lot of times it's a lot, it's a lot simpler than we really make it out to be, you know? We're thinking the big picture and the Lord's thinking, you know what? Maybe your neighbor needs the gospel or needs somebody to listen to, you know, or that coworker. Maybe they need, you know, you to offer to pray for them, these kind of things. So somebody who's controlled by the Spirit, find the gifts that God has called you to and then function with the unction of the Holy Spirit and do a head nod when you say it. <laughs> function with the unction. Um, also wisdom. They're filled with wisdom. And that's not just knowledge. Isn't that the interesting aspect of a relationship with Christ? You would think that if you just stayed home and just read books all the time, just listened to MP3s, solid spiritual stuff, you'd think you'd be a spiritual giant. If you don't integrate with people, make you a spiritual weirdo because God has created us to minister, to rub shoulders, to, to, to integrate with people. I remember a conversation with Mark a few years back about a home fellowship and, and somebody to fill the place with him. And, and the first question that I was talking to him about that was, the person that we're considering, does he minister to people? Is he, is he getting in there and is he praying with people and talking with people about the word of God and, and affecting and, and, and loving on these people? Because that's what ministry is, right? Loving people. Okay, so again, these are the people that God is calling to help. And uh, again, wisdom, uh, the application of facts. The Hebrew word for wisdom here is, uh, I believe it's chakma. And uh, interesting that it not only means wisdom in administration, but skill in war. It's 
because it's a battle. It's a battle for our souls in this room right now. I got to tell you right now, as far as the battle is concerned, my heart would break if there's a single person that would leave this room today that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. For those of you that are saints, before this time is over, we want to pray and make sure there isn't anybody that leaves today that doesn't know Jesus, that hasn't given their heart to them. So, qualifications for deacons, we find, in, among other passages in 1 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 8, it says, Likewise, deacons must be reverent, so they must have the fear of God. They must not be double-tongued, so it's not like you're going to get together with a deacon and find out the latest gossip on everybody in the church. Not given to much wine. In Calvary Chapel, that would be not given to anyone. Uh, not greedy for money. Uh, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But lest these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, too many jokes right now, I won't go there. Ruling their children in their own house as well, for those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. When you're serving the Lord, you're being his feet, and you're being his mouth, and you're being his heart. And you'll find that if you will abide in Christ, you will not have a problem finding his will and his plan and his place for you in this life. Verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So two things that we see here of the chief work of the minister is to give himself to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And that was the burden of the apostles' work, engaging in, leading others in prayer. I don't know about you, but you remember those times when you were brand new, born again, saved, and you're like looking for people to be sick or have car problems? You do that because... You're excited, and you know that you've got the spirit of the living God inside of you. And you don't care if somebody makes fun of you, because it's about Jesus. And so um, that continues on. That didn't have to happen just at conversion. That happens today. And he here's the key point, if I, could, if I could get your attention. Looking for opportunities to pray. It means in the course of my day, I'm usually thinking about Chuck, and I'm thinking about what Chuck wants to do, what he wants to eat, what he needs to do for the day. And I need to get off the Chuck menu and get onto the Mike menu and the Amber menu and the Tim menu and the Josh menu and think about how can I be praying. And for those of us who are older, and I'm not looking at anybody, but we might wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> we might have to go to the bathroom. Opportunities for prayer right there. That's all I'm saying. Jay's shaking his head. So the burden of the apostles' work was engaging in leading others in prayer. No Christian, much less any minister, can afford to neglect prayer to God. Hudson Taylor said he believed that to deal with God is at least as real as to deal with man. That when we get to prayer, we get to work. To be honest with you, that's probably the reason a lot of times that the prayer meeting is the least attended it's work, okay? But that's the nature of, of what we're, we're here to do because we are at war, and it's work of the most practical kind. Mr. F.W. Baller, after attending a meeting which Mr. Taylor led, wrote, I have never heard anyone pray like that. There is simplicity, tenderness, boldness, a power that hushed and subdued one and made it clear that God had admitted him into the inner circle of his friendship. When he spoke with God face to face, he did so as a man talks with a friend. So there was that closeness, there was that intimacy. Such praying was evidently the outcome of long lingering in the secret place and was as due from the Lord. I have heard many men pray in public since then, but the prayers of Hudson Taylor and Spurgeon stand all by themselves. Who that heard could ever forget them? It was the experience of a lifetime to hear Mr. Spurgeon pray, taking, as it were, the great congregation of 6,000 people by the hand and leading them into the holy place. Then to hear Mr. Taylor plead for China. You know, it makes me think of Dawn's longing for St. Joe. 
Poise and I were doing our Bible reading in 1 Samuel yesterday, and I wrote in each of their Bibles, including my own, ACTS. And it's that acronym, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. Great thing about supplication is that it can be for St. Joe. It can be for our leaders. It can be for Missouri. It can be for the United States. It can be what we want it to be. So uh, Hudson Taylor pleading for a nation. The minister of the gospel should also not think that he can pray and then neglect the ministry of the word. Nor should he think that because he preaches much, he may therefore neglect prayer. One is just as important as the other. But don't you know the ministry of the word occupies a lot more time. It did with the apostles, it should with us. And there's a crying need for true, earnest, devout preaching of the word today. Verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, then a guy by the name of Procurus, which had interesting parents naming him. Uh, He became the secretary of John the Apostle and became a bishop in one of the early churches then, before he was martyred. Nicanor, every time I look at that word, I think, how am I going to say it? I just said it. That's all I got. Timon, Perminius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. We don't know anything about the guys after Stephen, Phil, and Procurus, but there is some evidence that Nicholas, by tradition, becomes the founder of the Nicolaitans, which is a key uh, aspect of knowledge if you're going through the book of Revelation. We don't have a shred of historical or traditional evidence to verify that, but we do know about Stephen. And as this and the, and the following names are all Greek, then it's likely that they chose these Grecian guys to be able to minister to the Hellenist widows. Okay? So they're trying to work through a solution. Verse 6. Whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So when we read that they laid their hands, um, Joshua, when he took over for Moses, uh, was inducted in the office in the same way. That's in Numbers 27, 23, Deuteronomy 34, 9. Uh, it was a very ancient custom among the Jews, and it's implied the identification of that touched individual from all over the world for that office. You know, we're getting ready to do that when Pastor Pat and family get back from California. We're going to go before the congregation, and we're going to lay hands on and establish elders here in the church because that's what you do. That's what the Bible says to do. And we will lay, lay on hands to do so. So the apostles now lay their hands upon the deacons that they may know that they're offered to God. Verse 7. Then the word of God spread and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. We know historically that the number of priests in Jerusalem, um, even at the return of Ezra from Babylon, was more than 4,000. So it would have been a great evangelical triumph to reach these guys, the priests. Um, Josephus tells us that there were four courses, four separate groups of 5,000 or more priests. So there's a lot of people that are being added to the church. Sometimes we think, man, that's what we want. We want this place to be filled up. We've got to have help. We could, there's not a single person in here that can do this work alone. That's why we're called the body of Christ. So, um, but, but the priests, the priests that are getting saved, you know, they could have known information about, um, remember Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist? That would have been a cool story to hear about. So you got pregnant. How old were you? <laughs> wow. That's the Lord. Um, You know, they would have heard about Anna, Simeon in the temple. Um, How about those that were there when Jesus was crucified and that veil was ripped from top to bottom? That was an enormous veil. They, um, yeah, I don't know, just, again, uh, God's spirit moving on people, saving people. Verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. It's interesting that this record of great miracles being wrought by Stephen is the first time we read about somebody other than the 12 disciples, somebody other than an apostle doing miracles. 
we don't know his background. We don't know any kind of seminary or rabbinical education that he had. He's obviously very well read in the scripture. But he's a man there, and he wants to serve. So he's there, and he's there, and he's helping take care of widows, fulfilling their needs. He's waiting in tables. He just jumps into it with both feet. You got to admire that. He just went for it. It tells us he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's full of power. And that word's dunamis. We get that word dynamite. He's full of faith. He's full of wisdom. It's a man who's leading a full life. He would have led a full life if we never would have read about him and only met him in heaven. But I found something interesting in reading, preparing for this. Some manuscripts read that he was full of grace instead of faith. It's important to note that there's something in the human heart that has a problem with grace. Because what grace is, is that it's God's favor when you and I don't deserve it. And I think the problem that we have with the human heart is that what we like to do is we like to do good deeds, good religious acts, and then think that that's going to bring about God's love or God's acceptance. But that's not what the Bible says. Actually, the Bible tells us that it's all based upon what Jesus did. I can never be good enough, and neither can you. And so, great translation, uh, full of grace, the grace of God. Uh, even when we don't deserve it, uh, God blesses us anyway. And then it says that he did great uh, wonders and miracles among the people. So more than likely, consistent with the book of Acts, he's healing people. He's touching people's lives. Verse 9. Then there arose some from what's called the synagogue of the freedmen. So um, there through the Roman Empire, many Jews were subjected into slavery uh, by Rome as it becomes a republic. So they had either earned or purchased their freedom, uh, come back from Jerusalem. There were uh, Cyrenians, and they were Jews of Cyrene, and then those from Libya on the coast of Africa. Um, and then those from Cilicia. In Acts chapter 1, Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, says he's a Jew from Tarsus, a city of Cilicia. So as Stephen comes into the synagogue, he encounters Saul of Tarsus. This is interesting. Verse 10. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. We know, Josephus tells us, that um, Saul of Tarsus was raised by the rabbinical teacher Gamaliel and that Gamaliel could not keep him in enough books. That's how great an intellect he had. But here's a guy, we don't even know if he even had any kind of rabbinical training. And what does it say? The people in the synagogues were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Man, if I could convey anything this morning, it's who you know. Sometimes we think, you know, it's what you know. And we think in conversations, if, that, if I'm prepared and maybe there's an atheist or an agnostic and they think, man, if, I hope I know enough about creationism or about biology or genetics. You know what? No Jesusology. Spend time in the presence of the living God. Nobody can resist that wisdom. And these were the finest people that were available to debate this guy. I got to tell you, that gives me hope. Because in the book of Acts, it was noted that Peter and John were referred to as ignorant and unlearned men, and, and it meant that they, weren't, they didn't graduate from the finest rabbinical schools that the church leaders uh, had. But what they noted is that they had been with Jesus. Does it get any better than that? To have been with Jesus in the presence of him? So you can imagine Saul of Tarsus, he's going home. I don't know if he's married or not, but his wife is like, what happened with you? Stephen. <laughs> because anytime they have an, an argument or something that they want to bring up, well, what about this about Jesus? He's got wisdom. He's got the Holy Spirit. And so with all this guy's learning and education, this young, spirit-filled whippersnapper believer is filled with the Holy Spirit and he's putting them in their place. And the Greek is very forceful and literally reads, they had no strength to withstand his wisdom. 
They weren't able to answer his arguments. No array of numbers, learning, or talents can fairly meet or refute the arguments which prove the Christian religion to be from God. That, too, gives me comfort. Because, you know, a lot of times there are websites and you think, you know, what's, what's the current, you know, atheist philosophy? And, and it's good to know. It's good to know what people are talking about. Don't get me wrong. It's good to have information. But again, are we dealing with truth? How, how difficult is it, is it to share truth? If you've been changed, if Jesus has touched your life, you can tell somebody that. Amen? You can pray for that boldness. Say, God, give me the courage to just speak forward. It's very difficult to refute the power of a changed life. Okay? So here, in Divine Things, um, we see a man very, uh, he, he is very well versed in Jewish history. But again, the spirit that he spoke by was the Holy Spirit, and its power was irresistible. Um, several manuscripts add to this verse uh, because he reproved them with boldness they could not resist the truth verse 11 then they secretly induced men to say we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God so they secretly induced men to say the opponents of Stephen couldn't win a fair fight you know a lot of times when we're dealing with Christianity people are resorting to different methods because they can't win a fair fight. If you think about the main tenets of Christianity, do people really have a problem with like doing good to your neighbor? Carrying things for people? If somebody asks you to carry something like three times for as long, they don't really have a problem with those aspects. What they have a problem with though is with sin, right? And, and, and we're just called to call uh, the truth as it is. So um, they stirred up the people. Um, the opponents of Stephen could do nothing against the followers of Jesus until they got popular opinion on their side. Popular opinion, that's interesting. Previously, persecution against the apostles had been limited because popular opinion had been with them. Popular opinion can be easily shaped. I know that when I was a new believer, I went to a church where they would have people come forward and they would push people and they would fall and somebody would catch them. And I, I'm sorry, but I just, I don't, I don't believe that that's of the Lord. I remember one guy who was trying to uh, teach me how to be filled with the Holy Spirit uh, started pushing me, and I was like, dude, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm not doing anything. It's the Holy Spirit. I'm like, well, he's got your hands, you know? And, and the truth of the matter is, is I can be filled with the Holy Spirit, but Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 tell me nothing about falling backwards in the name of Jesus. What do I do with that? Okay. But again, popular opinion can be easily shaped. The same crowds that praised Jesus in Luke 19, 35 through 40 called for his crucifixion. The crowds that loved the apostles in 247 and 526 are now crying out against Stephen. You need to keep in mind why popular opinion should not shape our vision or our focus of the church. Let it rest on God's word. Amen? We're wrapping it up. So, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God, and this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change customs. So, these are the accusations that are against Stephen. These are interesting. This, interestingly, the same accusations that were against Jesus in Matthew 25. It's a good thing to be accused of the same things that Jesus was accused of. It's kind of a cool thing. It's not going to end well, but, you know, it, 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 he's not complaining in heaven now. Verse 12. They stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. We need to remember that there's a cost that's connected with our calling. It's not always comfortable. Sometimes it's stressful. And it closes in, it presses in on us. And we think, Lord, I don't, I don't know how I can do this. But don't despise the cost. I like the ESV in Philippians 3, 7 through 8 says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Not Calvary Chapel, not Chuck Smith. Okay, but for the cost of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss 
because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Some people think that Paul may have lost his wife for accepting Christ. It's a hard thing. But again, what did he gain? He gained everything. Verse 13. So they also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. He's accused of three things. So blasphemy against God, the physical temple, and the law. The actual structure itself. Now the reason that that's the case um, well, let me go ahead and read on uh, verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs to which Moses delivered to us. So the misnomer about Jesus, remember it was something that he said. Remember when in the beginning and the end of his ministry, he went and he cleansed the temple? And they wanted to know, well, what, by what authority do you do this? And they wanted him to show, us, show them a sign. Jesus said in John chapter 2, verse 19, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Well, they said, hey, it's taken 47 years to raise this temple. How are you going to do it in three days? But John told us he was, he was referring to the temple of his body. So this same accusation is brought uh, to Stephen, was brought at Jesus' trial in front of Pilate. Verse 15. I don't know, this blows me away. All who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. Do you think it was like a fat chubby baby from like a Hallmark card? I don't think so. In this scenario, the Sanhedrin, they would sit in a large semicircle. Um, he would be there in the middle and there were tears and there were 70 people looking down on him. Would have been a little stressful, humanly speaking. But he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with wisdom. He's filled with power. He's filled with knowledge. It was a building in the temple precincts. And again, they were accusing him of undermining Moses. How did Moses' face look when he came down from the mountain, though? He had that glow. He had such a glow that he had to cover it when he encountered the people because he didn't want them to see the glory depart. As we go to pray here this morning, we, we've got a man here who had such a personal encounter and closeness with Christ that wisdom couldn't out-argue what he had. Good people, I want to tell you here this morning, nobody can take that away from you. If you place your trust in Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask Mark and Tony to come forward right now. If you place your trust in Jesus Christ, you can have that glow, that presence where you, people perceive you have the look of an angel, whatever that looks like. Moses would take the veil off in the tabernacle when he'd go and he'd talk to God, but he'd put it back on. And, and I think that in this life, for this sneeze that we exist before eternity, we've got a veil on, but it's only for a short amount of time. We're going to see him face to face. Are you going to see him face to face? There's not a more important question I can ask you here this morning. It would rip my heart out if you left here this morning and had not publicly invited Christ into your life. I'm going to ask the saints right now to bow your heads, close your eyes, and to pray. Father, if there's anybody here in, the, in this room this morning, Lord, and they've never called out to you. They've never cried out to you. They've never admitted their sin. They've never looked to you to be saved so they could say, on this day, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Right now, with all the courage that is in heaven, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Because right now, Jesus wants to invite you and welcome you into his kingdom. This is not for Calvary. This is not for anything other than for Jesus Christ to realize that today needs to be the day of your salvation. When I go to heaven, I want to see you there. Mark wants to see you there. Tony wants to see you there. If you've never called out to him, you've never cried out to him, right now, go for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, just lift up your hand. I want to pray for you. I want to welcome you into God's kingdom. 
Father, I pray for everyone that's here this morning, God. And Lord, if we're all saved, Father God, I pray not only that that is sealed and confirmed and that we all have assurance of our salvation this morning, but God, take us to the next level. Lord, help us not just to walk out of here and just uh, go back into the world and do worldly things. Lord, help us to open your word, to pray, to look for opportunities to pray, and be filled with your Holy Spirit. We just pray these things in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. Let's worship one more time.